All right, guys, just uh, checking in here, and I want to make sure you guys can hear me. So if you can chat in and let me know my volume is coming in well, that would be great. And uh, it's really excited to do this Q&A with you guys. So I think this is great. Right, guys, just, um, uh, looks like volume's coming here, in. And I want to make sure you guys can hear me, so if you can chat. All right, fantastic. And so I know I, I see a bunch of you guys already chatting in. So I see Lou, I see John there chatting in. John's actually watching me and Dr. Berg at the same time. That's awesome. Um, you know, so anyways, if you have questions, you can chat in. We did get a lot of questions in from the master class, and I'm going to start by going through those. And really our goal here today is to help address questions that you guys have as you've gone through the Keto Masterclass. That was a tremendous amount of content, um, nine video lessons, roughly 30 to 50 minutes per lesson, um, tons of content. You know, many of you guys got the notes. We went through so much, really everything you need to know about Keto through that Masterclass. And, uh, you know, obviously there's always going to be questions. And so I'm going to do my best to address those questions. And I want to thank you guys for taking the time to be on this. Um, especially being on live with me here really gives you the advantage because I'm going to try to also jump in and answer your questions when I'm finished with these, this question list that I have. And also, you know, I want to thank those of you guys that have gone ahead and purchased our Keto Masterclass. It was a tremendous amount of work, a lot of cost. Uh, that went in, that went into creating this project, and um, you know couldn't do it without your support. So I just want to thank those of you guys that have gone ahead and uh, and have purchased this. That really helps us, uh, obviously, be able to fund doing things like this and be able to create more great content for you guys. So thank you for that. If you haven't purchased it, you know I, I definitely want to encourage you to consider it. Um, consider purchasing it. I think you'll get tremendous value out of it. We've got great bonuses that you can check out as well um, that will just give you so much value. So if you do that, I'd really be honored. And um, let's jump into these questions. So the first question I have is from Kathy. She says, I know that keto is good for diabetes if no gallbladder and fatty liver, but I've heard that a history of pancreatitis is a big no. I've had this and have noticed that some fat causes pain. I've always thought that low carb, low sugar, and moderate healthy fat makes sense, but 70% is concerning for me. What is the lowest fat percentage that can still be keto? Um, you know, this is a really good question. So um, when you have pancreatitis or if you had a history of pancreatitis, you may not be able to produce the, the uh, digestive enzyme lipase at the level that you need. Okay, so it's certainly possible there are certain circumstances where, you know, you may not be able to get into ketosis, but I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. Just because you have a history of it, but you're not currently suffering from it, um, doesn't mean that you can't get into ketosis. And so, uh, in general, you're looking at 60 to 80% of your calories coming from fat in order to get a ketosis. The more active you are, the less calories you should need coming from fat, meaning that if you're very active, you're exercising regularly, okay, you can handle, you'll have better carbohydrate tolerance and protein tolerance. And so some people do great on 60, 65% fat and maybe a higher protein, 30% protein and maybe up to 10% carbohydrate diet. And so, but those are t tend to be, you know, very active people, people that are very insulin sensitive. So it can be different for each individual as far as that goes. Um, and so you just kind of have to, you have to lean into it and see how your body does. I think that's important. And if you have a history of pancreatitis, really important to use enzymes that have a high amount of lipase. We have a great one on our, on my online store. It's called Keto Digest. And it's very high in lipase as well as proteases. So different enzymes that are involved with breaking down proteins and fats, very high in that. Your typical traditional digestive enzyme is not going to be very, very high in lipase. Um, when you're going to ketogenic diet, it's, it's more advantageous to get something like the Keto Digest um, or an enzyme that is higher in your, uh, your fat digesting enzyme lipase. Okay, so that's important. 
Also doing things like apple cider vinegar and water before you eat will help activate your digestive enzymes. So bitters like uh, apple cider vinegar, ginger, you can do lemon ginger juice. I know I showed you guys the one that I get uh, in the Keto Masterclass. I think it was video lesson seven, I believe, when I showed you that. Um, you could take, you know, just a, a little shot of that. And that really bitter, the bitterness of lemon, lime, or if it's apple cider vinegar, you should always dilute it uh, because it can be dangerous for your esophagus if you don't. But the bitterness of like lemon, lime, or ginger, or something like that, will activate your vagus nerve and help your body produce digestive juices. So you can also do that to help improve your digestion, and kick out more of your digestive enzymes. So that can be helpful. Uh, let's see, Lynn asks, can you further explain the difference between C8 and C10 MCT oils? Which should I be eating in my diet? It's a great question. So I talked a lot about MCT oils in the Keto Masterclass. So definitely review that. But basically, C8 and C10, C8 is the most ketogenic. So if you want to, if you want to create ketones quickly, very, very quickly, I recommend putting a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon, maybe up to a tablespoon, uh, although you should start low, okay? Start always starting low and kind of working your way up with MCT oil, but putting that on your food or in a protein shake or whatever it is, whatever you're eating, will help your body produce ketones quicker, okay? And I think that's important to, to understand. So, um, can you guys see me? I'm just trying to, let me see, okay. Looks like I'm sharing my screen, uh, which is fine. You guys can still see me, I don't know. I don't know how to turn that off. Um, okay. So let's see, I see sunflower oil is on the bad list, but is it okay to use high oleic sunflower oil that is organic and cold pressed? Um, you know, sunflower oil is higher in omega-6 fats. It's got a poor omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid ratio, and that's problematic, okay? So what we want is, we want basically like a, a two to one ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 or, or close to a one to one. Sunflower oil, I believe, is something like like 10 or 12 to one ratio. So it's very high in omega-6 fats. Most people already have too much omega-6 fats. So I'm not a huge fan of using a lot of sunflower oil. Um, you know, if you have an occasional product that has that in there, um, it's probably not the worst thing, especially if it's a high oleic sunflower oil, meaning that's got lower amounts of omega-6s less polyunsaturated fats, more monounsaturated fats. But in general, I'm not a huge fan of using that. I would prefer to stick with things like avocado oil, which is a true monounsaturated fat, olive oil, coconut oil, um, grass-fed butter, tallow, things like that. Those are really good fats to use. Um, let's see, Kathleen says, I cannot understand the information about LDL and HDL. It's contrary to everything we've learned. HDL is supposed to be high and LDL low. However, if the LDL to HDL ratio is supposed to be two to one, this means that LDL is much higher than HDL. So basically, LDL is always gonna be higher than HDL, all right? So your low density lipoprotein cholesterols, your LDL particles, um, they're always gonna be higher than HDL. So this is the first thing to understand, but the right ratio is a two to one ratio, okay? Or, you know, basically under three to one. So if you have less than three parts LDL for every one part HDL, that's a healthy ratio. So that's basically what you're looking at. And then ideally you want your triglyceride to HDL ratio to be as close to one as possible, but anything under two is okay. So if your HDL is 70 and your triglycerides are, you know, 120, it's still in the okay range, but I would st I would prefer to try to get that triglyceride down under 100 and, you know, basically close to a one-to-one -one ratio there of triglyceride to HDL. So I hope that helps uh, make sense there, Kathleen. Um, you, when, when we talk about having low LDL and high HDL, what we're referring to is their ranges. So you're always going to have over 100, or unless you're on medications, you're going to have over 100 LDL particles, right? Whereas it's very rare to get 100 HDL particles and it may not even be healthy. So your HDL typically is going to range between, on a healthy range, 50 to 90. Sometimes people will be lower, 30 and 40s, and that's not healthy. 
Um, should always be over 50, your HDL, and ideally, you know, roughly 60 to 80 in that range is a, is a really good range for your HDL. So you're always going to have more LDL than HDL. Uh, let's see. Jackie says, I was looking at your MCT oil, and it looks like they're in plastic bottles, but they don't say anything about BPA-free. So yes, our Keto Brain is uh, BPA-free bottles. Uh, so yes, it is. And they're in bottles that are resistant to breaking, which is important for the shipping process. Um, and so let's see, health conditions. Randall says, I'm also dealing with vitiligo, which is like a skin pigmentation, autoimmune condition that affects our skin. I've had it for about eight to 10 years with no success treating it. It's over 5% of my body and I feel like a freak. I'm really sorry to hear that, Randall, number one. Um, obviously, it tells us that there's damage to your gut. When we think about autoimmune conditions like vitiligo, um, which is an autoimmune condition that affects our skin pigmentation, Autoimmune conditions, there's a three-legged stool. We always have a genetic component, but there's also leaky gut and there's chronic stress. So at some level, his body was stressed and he had leaky gut and that activated these antibodies. And so when we're looking at correcting that, we've got to address the gut. We've also got to address our blood sugar because if we don't have healthy blood sugar, it's going to cause stress on the gut. So a ketogenic lifestyle, a nutrient-dense, real food ketogenic lifestyle can absolutely be a foundational point for helping overcome an autoimmune disease like vitiligo. And so sticking with the kind of foods that I've talked about throughout the master class, I think is really important, Randall. And you also may need to work with you know, a functional health practitioner to run some specific labs to try to understand, do you have a gut infection? Uh, do you have you know, other issues that that are underlying. Do you have uh, you know, high levels of environmental toxins in your system? Do you have, um, let's see, do you have insulin resistance? You know, different things like that. So, uh, so anyways, uh, a functional health practitioner will be able to help you with that. If you obviously can find one in your local area, also my team, Melissa and Danielle are fantastic. You can reach out to them. You can go to my website and uh, they can customize pl a plan for you to help you get well. So I would definitely uh, consider that as well. Let's see. Judy says, I've been diagnosed with kidney failure and I'm on dialysis and would have been diagnosed with diabetes. Stents have been placed in my heart. Would a keto diet be safe and help me? Well, Judy, number one thing is, you know, obviously, I, I, you know, a ketogenic diet and everything I'm saying here is, you know, not meant to obviously uh, treat or cure any sort of, of health condition. You know, we always have to have that medical disclaimer. However, if I had kidney failure or diabetes, I absolutely would do a ketogenic diet. So we know that diabetes or high blood sugar and high insulin is the most damaging thing for the kidneys. So high blood sugar, when blood sugar is really high and we can't get it into the cells, what happens is the sugar molecules will bind to proteins and create something called an advanced glycolytic enzyme. Okay, and so advanced, I'm sorry, it's advanced glycation enzyme. So A-G-E, advanced glycation enzyme. And those A-G-E's accelerate the aging process in our body and they're like shrapnel going through the kidneys. They literally destroy the blood vessels in the kidneys and the, and the kidney tissue and lead to kidney failure. And so um, the best thing to do is get your blood sugar and your insulin down. We do that through fasting. We do that through a ketogenic diet. So without a doubt, uh, that would that would be my number one, you know, the number one place I would go as far as a nutrition perspective would be a real food ketogenic diet with intermittent fasting and maybe even doing an extended fast as well to help the body to heal itself. Okay, take, take the stress off those kidneys and allow the innate intelligence that's within us to start to heal and repair and regenerate our body. Uh, Laura says, I would love to know how the keto diet could help me continue to prevent diabetes and minimize its negative effects. Well, again, diabetes is characterized by high blood sugar and high insulin levels. And a ketogenic diet by nature teaches the body to no longer depend on sugar for fuel, but instead to be able to be a good fat burner. And we naturally lower our blood sugar and we lower our insulin levels. You can't actually get into ketosis with high blood sugar or with high insulin. So by nature, the, the approach of actually getting into ketosis 
heals diabetes and also prevents your, you from getting diabetes. So yeah, it's definitely the go-to for anybody that uh, is looking to prevent diabetes. Judy says, I'm already doing a beginner on keto and intermittent fasting. I have type 2 diabetes, recently experienced some UTI symptoms. Is this common? So UTI symptoms in women in general is common. I've looked at a lot of labs and a lot of women don't even know that they have UTIs and I see them. So I think UTIs in general are common. Is it common on a ketogenic diet? Absolutely not. It's not any more common on a ketogenic diet than any other sort of nutrition plan. So, um, you know, the fact that you've had type 2 diabetes tells me that your immune system is weak. And the reason why I know that is because when you have a, a blood sugar of 120, it reduces your white blood cells phagocytic index. And that means their ability to uh, basically eat bad guys, eat um, viruses and other pathogens, it reduces that by 75%. And so type 2 diabetes, to be diagnosed with that, you have to have a fasting blood sugar of 126. So anybody that has been diagnosed with diabetes has a very weak immune system. And so then you're going to be much more likely to have UTI issues. And so that's not related to the ketogenic diet. The ketogenic diet is actually helping your body overcome those things. And so definitely continue to follow that. Treat your UTI. I've got a great article on my website that you can check out that talks about natural things you can do for UTIs, uh, but continue to follow a real food ketogenic diet uh, along with intermittent fasting. I think it's the best thing you could do from a foundational nutrition perspective. Stacy says, I'm having low blood glucose issues with, when my carbs are below 50 grams per day. What can I do to counter that? She said her ketones are around 0.7 to 1.5 millimoles but when I was at that level, my blood glucose was around 66 or 68. Actually, Stacy, that's that's good. Uh, I think the question you need to ask is, are you having symptoms? So there's nothing wrong with having your blood sugar around 66 or 68. In fact, that's great as long as you feel mentally clear. I can guarantee you right now, if I were to check my blood sugar, it's probably right in that range. Okay, and I'm probably I'm probably around one to 1.5 millimoles of ketones right now. Okay. And I feel amazing. And so you can feel incredible with your blood sugar under 50, uh, especially if you're fasting and your ketones will, will elevate up typically in the three, three to four range at that point. But yeah, you can, you can feel great with a blood sugar in the sixties. If your ketones are elevated, right in that range above 0 0.5 and you, um, your body's keto adapted. It's good at using the ketones for as an energy source. So think about that. Okay. So if you are noticing hypoglycemic types of uh, experiences, like you feel like you're dizzy, you have cravings, things like that, I would try taking some salts. Okay. A lot of times it's an electrolyte deficiency. I talked all about this in the keto master class. So you know, definitely, I want to encourage those of you guys again. Um, if you haven't purchased the Keto Masterclass, I go through everything in there, so definitely check that out. But, um, but oftentimes, electrolyte deficiency can mask itself as hypoglycemia. Let's see, Rosemary, Rosemary says, will keto help with my food allergies? I pretty much do a histamine diet most of the time and take DAO, which is a supplement to help with, uh, with histamines. Uh, uh, before supper to help cut down the number of antihistamines I have to take. <clears throat> well, Rosemary, you know, keto as a foundational nutrition plan itself will help provide an environment where your gut will be able to heal. And so we know food allergies and sensitivities are related to leaky gut. And so, yes, keto can, can absolutely be a great foundational point in helping to heal the gut because it reduces inflammation in the body and we've got to reduce inflammation to heal the gut. So it definitely can help uh, more indirectly than directly on that. But as your gut heals up and your body's able to absorb nutrients more effectively, then you'll notice less and less of those types of symptoms. Let's see. Karen says, I don't have a thyroid and I'm on replacement. So thyroid replacement therapy. Could this be causing my increased cholesterol levels? They've been slowly rising over the years, 15 or more since my thyroidectomy. 
and dramatically since I started keto one year ago. I've lost weight slowly, so I know it's not the rapid weight loss, but I'm also consistently vitamin D deficient. Can you chime in on that? Well, um, I can't remember exactly which lesson, but one of the lessons I went through all the reasons why somebody might have high cholesterol, whether they're on keto or not on keto. One of the big reasons is they're not getting enough thyroid hormone. Okay, so your active thyroid hormone, your T3, actually activates the LDL receptor on each cell of the body. And that LDL receptor basically is like the docking station for the LDL particle. So that way the LDL, which carries vitamin A, vitamin D, all these powerful nutrients, uh, can actually bring it into the cell. The cell needs those nutrients. And so if we don't have enough active T3, then oftentimes we will have higher LDL because those LDL are not able to dock effectively at a lot of the cells. So addressing and getting enough active T3, uh, thyroid hormone, is very important for that. Vitamin D deficiency also plays a very big role with higher amounts of LDL. The reason being is that, in particular, sunlight exposure. Um, the reason why is that the backbone of producing vitamin D is squalene, and that's also used to produce cholesterol. So if we're not getting enough vitamin D or enough um, sunlight stimulation, then we're going to go down this path and we're going to take squalene and produce more LDL rather than vitamin D. So that's also a big factor. And another big thing that I see as well is poor bile flow, right? So oftentimes people have very sluggish bile and bile is made up of bilirubin, cholesterol, and bile salts. And sometimes we need more bile salts to move that bile and that helps our body to reduce the amount of LDL particles uh, in the system as well because a lot of times those, the cholesterol will be recycled and artificially uh, elevate our LDL. So those are all things to, to look at and to address. And again, I discussed that in detail in the Keto Masterclass, so definitely, uh, definitely look at that. Let's see, Joan says, can the keto diet help my brain health? I'm struggling with increased forgetfulness and searching for words that I can't seem to remember. You know, one of the best benefits of a ketogenic diet is brain health. In fact, that's why I, I do it. I'm not trying to lose weight. I'm at my ideal weight. What I'm trying to do is maximize my energy and my mental performance so I can be the best person. I can be the best father, husband, um, doctor, the best human being that I can possibly be. And that's why I follow a nutrient-dense ketogenic diet. So without a doubt, that's one of the biggest benefits is better mental clarity, better emotional stability, um, faster cognitive speed. You're able to think sharper and quicker. You don't have the hunger, the cravings. Uh, it's powerful for that. So without a doubt, I would recommend that, Joan. Let's see. Maxine asks, can someone who has a stomach ulcer be on the keto eating plan? You know, this is a really good question. So if you have a stomach ulcer, then oftentimes when you eat food, you are going to oftentimes experience pain because stomach acid starts to burn that ul ulcer. What I recommend, and I have a great article on stomach ulcers, is I recommend a liquid-based diet for somewhere between two to four weeks in the beginning. And the reason why I recommend that is you don't need to produce the stomach acid. So you're doing protein shakes. You can do things like bone broth. Okay, we recommend Kettle and Fire, a really good brand of bone broth. Uh, but you can make those protein shakes and you can make them keto protein shakes. So you can do, you know, coconut milk and avocado and protein powder, for example. Okay, so you can do something along those lines. Um, but we're recommending more of a liquid-based diet. What can be really tough is if you have a stomach ulcer and you eat a big steak because you need to produce a lot of stomach acid to break down that steak and that can be really problematic. Now, the other question is trying to get to the root cause of the stomach ulcer. Are you a chronic smoker? Do you drink a lot of alcohol? Okay, those things can, can lead to the creation of stomach ulcers. Are you on chronic pain medications? So whether they are prescription or non-prescription, like taking ibuprofen or something like that, can cause stomach ulcers. So will keto help reduce pain in your body? Well, it's keto, a keto diet is a very powerful anti-inflammatory diet. We know that inflammation causes pain, so without a doubt, it's going to help there. Or is it an H. pylori infection in your stomach, which is the number one cause of stomach ulcers? Okay, and so... 
with an H. pylori infection, certainly would want to work with a you know functional health practitioner. I also have a great article on my website on H. pylori, um, and there are strategies and things that you can do and take uh, in order to help reduce that. But you can absolutely do a ketogenic diet. You would want to do more of a liquid-based ketogenic diet to take stress off of that area, um, and you know utilizing some some key supplements to help heal the gut will be very beneficial. Okay, great question. Let's see, Margaret asks, what are your thoughts on nitrates in bacon, lunch meat, and hot dogs? Uh, great question. Um, I, don't, I, would, I would not want to eat nitrates. And so I'm not a fan of consuming, uh, well, I'm a fan of consuming nitrate-free grass-fed bacon, ideally grass-fed beef. I personally, um, my my personal philosophy is that I don't I don't consume pig or pork products. Okay, partly it's because of how I was raised, but also partly it's because I don't believe that pigs are healthy animals to eat. So I personally enjoy uh, grass fed beef bacon. I think that uh, grass fed beef cows eat you know grass, and if they're eating 100% green grass diet, they're very rich in nutrients, and you can get nitrate free grass fed beef bacon. You can get um, grass-fed hot dogs, you can get nitrate-free lunch meat. So I would recommend going for the highest quality source of those things and, and getting nitrate-free. Let's see. Adaya asks, thank you for the opportunity, but I'm not sure how I can do keto while I'm vegetarian, very close to vegan. Is it going to work for me? So believe it or not, Adaya, there, there are a lot of people that are doing plant-based, vegetarian, and even vegan ketogenic diets. I know there's a big Facebook group if you kind of look at look that up. Um, I know my Cancer Cleanse program, which is a program that I've used with a lot of cancer patients, is a plant-based ketogenic diet. So it's not a vegan diet. We recommend consuming some eggs, uh, some bone broth, things like that on, on occasion, but it's a low protein diet, uh, very rich in plants and healthy fats. And you've got things like coconut and coconut fats and avocados and olives and olive oil and nuts and seeds and things like that, that that can be the base. You've got cruciferous vegetables, you've got green leafy vegetables, sprouts, fermented vegetables, um, herbs, lemons, limes, lots of things like that. So there's still plenty of food to eat um, if you're a vegetarian close to vegan. I personally don't recommend a vegan diet. I think that consuming uh, a certain amount of healthy, sustainably raised, um, nutrient-dense animal products is very, very healthy. So whether it was even just eggs or bone broth or um, maybe some wild-caught fish or something like that or grass-fed butter, uh, just doing a little bit, I think, I think is uh, is important. Okay, uh, but you know you could certainly lean in that direction and get you know 90, 95 percent of your calories from from plant plant-based foods. And, uh, and, and be very healthy, you know, depending on your body type. For some people, they're going to do great on more of a carnivore-based, less vegetable-based diet. And some people are going to do great on more of a, you know, close to vegan diet. So everyone's different. And, uh, you know, part of, the, part of the process is really discovering what works best for you. Okay, but all of, you can be keto whether you're a vegan or whether you're, you know, on a carnivore diet. Let's see. Sarah says, I know it's early, so maybe I'm jumping ahead, but can the program be done paleo? Um, yeah, ketogenic diet, well, without a doubt, fits into a paleo-based uh, diet principle because paleo says, hey, we want to eat more like our ancestors. We want to get rid of grains and sugars and legumes and things like that. And you can obviously take dairy out. So a lot of people on a ketogenic diet do a lot of dairy, but you can take that out true traditional paleo is dairy free so you can take that out and um, you know it's pretty much keto paleo diet then let's see is red wine allowed on a keto diet margaret asks great question most red wines believe it or not actually have sugar in them so what you want is to find a really good one that doesn't that's been fully tested i actually use a company called dry farms wine and margaret i have a i have a great article on my website uh, that that if you look up like is wine allowed on a keto diet something along those lines where I actually go through all the problems with the wine industry I don't trust any other wines other than this company dry farms wine fantastic company 
and they basically vet out all the different companies and find the kind of wines that are not going to elevate your blood sugar, that have the most polyphenols. And polyphenols are great for your gut microbiome. They're great for reducing inflammation, oxidative stress in your body. So you can drink a little bit of that with your meal and actually can help with your digestion, help reduce oxidative stress in your body. So I think that's important. Uh, do I recommend a lot of alcohol? Definitely not. Okay. Uh, one to two cups maybe of this red wine. And, uh, you know, I might drink maybe a, a glass, a glass a month, right. Or something like that. But I think if you were to do like maybe three to five glasses a week of the right type of wine, I think it's totally healthy. Um, and you know, doing it on separate days, not, not all on the same day. Um, <clears throat> so I think that's totally fine. Totally healthy. What advice do you have for eating out while on a ketogenic diet? Well, basically what I do is <clears throat> I look for restaurants, ideally that have clean meat. So I'm looking for restaurants that have things like bison or grass-fed beef or something along those lines. And if I could find restaurants like that, which in most cities, you can find restaurants that have bison or grass-fed beef or you know more of a, that maybe have like a farm to table where they're using local farmers. <clears throat> And then I try to get meat, vegetables, and, you know, olive oil if they have it, or, or butter, or something along those lines, Some, or oftentimes guacamole or avocado on my food. So I just try to ask for the right things. I think that's important. Sometimes I'll bring my own olive oil um, to some restaurants. So basically, I'm trying to get meat, vegetables, and healthy fats. That's really what, what you're looking for um, when you go out on a keto diet. Let's see, Vanessa says, what about different cheeses on keto? Can I eat cheese? And are some cheeses better than others? Yes, so as long as you don't have a dairy sensitivity, you can eat cheese on a ketogenic diet. <clears throat> That's totally fine. Some people do have sensitivities to dairy, so it's always good to kind of check how your body's responding to the cheese. If you eat cheese and you notice uh, you just don't feel as good, you have more digestive symptoms, maybe you have hunger, cravings, things like that. Uh, maybe eczema or you know skin issues, then I would avoid the cheese. Uh, when you, I'm not a cheese kind of source. I don't know a tremendous amount about cheese, but the best kind of cheese is going to be your raw, grass-fed cheese, right? Or maybe goat cheese or grass-fed cheese, cheese from grass-fed cows. Let's see. Sandra says I'm allergic to eggs, but they are included in so many keto recipes and meal plans. Are there safe substitutes for me? Yeah, I mean, you can just choose not to eat those recipes, right? So there's tons of recipes you can make without eggs, right? And there are a lot of people that are sensitive to eggs. So you can just choose not to um, you know, not to use those recipes or try to find some, some things that you can be using instead. Um, in some cases, you can use things like... Um, like the Lakanto maple syrup in certain baked goods, which is, uh, you know, the among fruit erythritol uh, syrup, and that can help with, you know, baked goods and things like that. But in general, if you're allergic to eggs, just avoid those recipes. And instead, you know, you can have, you can have steak, you can have chicken, you can have um, fish, right? You can have lots of vegetables. I mean, there's so many other foods, avocados, olives, olive oil. So, there's still a lot of things you can do. And I find that to be common whenever we're talking about different nutrition plans. A lot of people, they get focused on what they can't have and they find all these recipes with foods that they can't have, right? Instead of thinking about all the great foods you can have. And so that's what you want to be focused on is just the, all the great foods you can have and getting more and more creative with those foods. Let's see, Deb says, I miss fruit. Are there any fruits I can include in my keto meal plan? Well, to begin with lemons and limes, avocados and olives are all fruit. So those should be in your meal plan. You should be using those every single day. Lemons, lemon or lime, avocados and olive oil. So, or olives or olive oil. So those are all fruit. Now, as you get keto adapted, and especially if you want to cycle out, right? When I talk about this in the keto masterclass, I talk about how to strategically carb cycle. Fruit is great for that. So when you, when you find your strategic carb cycling strategy, like I discussed in the masterclass, using fruit to cycle out of, out of ketosis is great. Have berries, have an apple, have pineapple, you know, whatever fruit you really 
thoroughly enjoy and that's that's a great way to cycle in more carbs to carb load and then to then you go back on you know your keto approach and your carb cycling okay and again I discuss all of that in the keto masterclass let's see Barbara says I have a question about alcohol does it convert to sugar in the body should be avoided if one is following a ketogenic lifestyle no it doesn't convert into sugar um, but uh, you know alcohol just like any sort of healthy lifestyle shouldn't have a large place in a healthy lifestyle, right? It should be used in, in moderation for enjoyment. And ideally, if you're going to consume alcohol, get the most nutrient-dense form. That's why I like the Dry Farms red wine, rich in polyphenols, because alcohol is going to put more stress on the system. It's going to create, you know, your, your liver is going to have to work harder on phase one and two liver detox. And so getting polyphenols and antioxidants with it really helps the body with that. So I think red wine is the best approach um, and just using it in moderation. Let's see, how much apple cider vinegar does Dr. Jockers or men we take each day? Uh, great question, Linda. Depends on the individual, but like maybe a tablespoon in water three times a day would be a great strategy or you know, doing it in the morning and then um, perhaps you know, before lunch and before dinner, whatever your meals are, can be, can be a great strategy. Okay. And, you know, you could literally drink a tablespoon in, you know, every eight to 16 ounces of water you drink throughout the day. And that actually the malic acid in there will actually help your bile duct. It'll help loosen your bile duct and improve your digestive juice flow. So this is why I'm a fan of doing lemon, lime, apple cider vinegar, putting on your food, putting it in water. So you can do a lot of it. You just got to make sure it's diluted because if you're doing a lot of apple cider vinegar, concentrated it's gonna it can affect your esophagus I think we've probably all experienced that and also it's good to not have it too concentrated because it can also um, be bad for your teeth so you know if you're gonna do concentrated apple cider vinegar like a tablespoon and two to four ounces of water that would be fairly concentrated only do that right before a meal don't do that throughout the day but you can dilute it down, put a tablespoon in 8 to 16 ounces of water and dilute it, and that's not going to be bad for your teeth. That's fine. How do I make sure I get enough electrolytes? That's what Milton asks. Uh, make sure you're salting your foods well. I think that's probably the most important thing. And eating vegetables, things like avocados, green leafy vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, a lot of magnesium, potassium, calcium in there, and then make sure you're salting your foods well. Uh, let's see, Milton asks, does the doctor tell us what is the highest carb total per day to eat and still be considered low carb? Okay, well, I do go through that in the master class, actually. And so to really get into a keto zone, you're going to need to be under 50 grams of net carbs a day. So net carbs is total carbs minus fiber and sugar alcohols. So you subtract fiber and sugar alcohols from your total amount of carbs come up with your total carb count. Now, for some people, they're going to need to get a lot lower. They're going to need to get under 20 or 30 grams. So it depends on the individual. And then <clears throat> when you carb cycle, uh, depending on your activity level, depending on how your body responds, like you know how long it takes you to get back into ketosis afterwards, that's going to help you understand how much carbs or what your carb tolerance is going to be. And I go through that in the master class. So, if, you know, again, <clears throat> if you haven't checked out the master class, you haven't, you haven't ordered that, I would, I would recommend that. So you can really dial that in. I think that'll be really helpful. What's the best thing one can do after such a momentary lapse to try to reestablish blood sugar balance? Can you take some supplements like berberine, chromium, go for a super long walk, drink a lot of water, fast for 12 hours, eat some protein with some good fats? What works best and fastest? Great question, Christina. So if you eat, you know, a big piece of cake or something like that, I would definitely recommend, number one, getting some activity. <clears throat> so whether you're dancing, whether you are going for a walk, something along those lines, get some movement in. Okay, you can even just go and do, you know, 20, 20 uh, air squats, right? That's going to help activate your GLUT4 receptor and get more of that sugar cleared out of the bloodstream, make your body more insulin sensitive. <clears throat> so that would be good and make it less inflammatory. Um, yes, also a good idea to eat protein and fats if you're going to have some, some sugar. Uh, I think that is a good idea because <clears throat> it will help slow down the release of the sugar. And then, yeah, definitely 
um, fasting the next day can be a great way to get back in, to basically burn through that sugar and get back into fat burning. So doing, you know, maybe a 16 hour, 18 hour fast the next day, maybe even a 24 hour fast can be a really good strategy to get back into fat, fat burning. So really everything you talked about, drink hydrating your body can be good. Certainly taking supplements, chromium, berberine, alpha lipoic acid, um, vanadium, which is another good mineral for, for blood sugar stability, all really good. <clears throat> Tammy says, my question is this, if I eat only one to two meals a day on keto, how should I take my supplements or medications? Well, some supplements you don't take with meals, others you do. So you, so the supplements or medications you would normally take with a meal, you would take with your meal, right? Just like you would normally. So, um, so that's, that's how you do it. And then the ones you don't take with meals, right? There are supplements that are beneficial or medications like thyroid medication that are best to take away from meals. You, you just take those in the morning when you wake up or, you know, at night before you go to bed, <clears throat> depending on the supplement or medication. <clears throat> Let me get some water here. Okay, guys, hopefully you guys are getting a lot out of this. <coughs> Let's see. Randall says, I feel too skinny and can't seem to gain weight, gain back some weight up for my height. I believe the body has a set point, but I'm concerned that on keto, I'll lose even more weight and don't want that. <coughs> so the key with not losing weight on keto, that's like me. I don't want to lose any weight on keto is number one to when you eat, eat really well, eat till you're satiated. Number two, do strength training. So I do strength training. So I work out my legs twice a week. I work out my upper body twice a week and I try to lift heavy. Okay. And so doing strength training will help you keep lean body mass on. If I'm not doing strength training, my, my muscle mass is going to atrophy and it's going to be very hard for me to keep weight on. Okay. So if you're very skinny, it's very important to do strength training exercises and then also to eat when you eat, eat really well, eat till you're fully satiated. Okay, that's very, very important. Um, <clears throat> let's see. John says a lot of people say the keto diet should not be as long term because it's unnatural and indeed unhealthy. For those who want to use a keto diet, consider doing a gallbladder flush before and after. This is a way for your body to move through the extra fat load and burden that is coming down the pike. And to know that you are giving your pancreas a bit of rest from having to overproduce insulin, and this will ultimately be helpful in the long term. These are the concerns I have with keto. <clears throat> okay, so doing gallbladder flush for many people can be great, right? And I, I recommend it. I have a great article on uh, gallstones and how to do a gallbladder flush. <clears throat> and actually, as a bonus, when you purchase the Keto Masterclass, we've included it kind of last minute. I actually have my Heal Your, Your Liver Now PDF, which actually has my full gallbladder cleanse, my full um, bile cleanse, basically liver gallbladder cleanse in it. So you can check that out. <clears throat> but yes, I'm a huge fan of that. And doing things on a regular basis to support bile flow, I talk all about that in the Keto Masterclass. So definitely important things to do. <clears throat> I'm clearing my throat a lot today. <coughs> so, John, I, I absolutely would agree with that. Um, is it sustainable long term? For some individuals, it is, right? For some individuals, I recommend carb cycling, where we occasionally cycle out of carbs. We look at our ancestors. They spent time in ketosis and time out of ketosis, depending upon a food availability. In our society today, it's very easy for us to eat you know, all day long, right? And we can get access to a whole bunch of fruit in the winter time when our ancestors, you know, wouldn't have had access to that. So it's important to use ketosis strategically. That's what I'm a fan of is strategic ketosis and then cycling out as desired um, and in a strategic manner as well, based on your bodily needs. For some individuals that are very insulin resistant, carb cycling is not a good idea. You need to really focus on healing your insulin receptors and being in a deep state of ketosis for a long time. 
For other individuals, you're more insulin sensitive. It's actually a good idea for you to get into ketosis, spend some time there, and then cycle out of ketosis. This sort of diet variations, feast, famine cycle, is ancestral. It's great for our body, and it's really what our bodies, our, our genetic blueprint was designed for. So I'm not necessarily an advocate of, you know, being in ketosis all the time for the rest of your life. Um, I'm an advocate of personalizing the diet so you spend time in ketosis strategically and time out of ketosis um, as needed or as your body, uh, as what's best for your body. Let's see, kids and keto. Can my 12-year-old son safely eat a keto diet to lose weight? Certainly can. A ketogenic diet can be great for kids. Certainly not necessary if they're not overweight, but um, you know, my kids spend time in and out of ketosis as well. Sometimes they're you know, on a lower carb diet. Sometimes they're eating more fruit and things like that. So, um, but yeah, totally safe. Totally safe. And if you're eating, you know, using real foods, you can absolutely, uh, you know, include children in that. Now, do children, young children that are growing fast need to be in ketosis? No, they don't. Like, you know, if they're normal, they're healthy, they're not suffering with a, a chronic disease. Having them have more fruit or more starchy vegetables, carrots, things like that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If they are struggling with certain health conditions, could might be a good idea to try try moving them into ketosis. So I think that's helpful. Okay, last question here. Will MCT oil break a fast or lemon water? I read that MCT oil will, lemon or lime will not. Yeah, that's basically what I recommend is, you know, if you're fasting, MCT oil theoretically breaks a fast because it's got calories, whereas lemon water really doesn't have calories. So that will break a fast. Now, if you do MCT oil in your coffee and that's all you do, will you still get a lot of benefits? You definitely will get a ton of benefits from that compared to eating a meal because you're still going to be getting a high level of autophagy. And the reason for that is because you're calorie restricted. Calorie restriction and protein restriction helps stimulate this process of self-eating or autophagy where you get these tremendous health benefits. So uh, it breaks a fast, but at the same time, you still get you know, probably 90% of the benefits of the fasting. So totally fine to do that. Um, this same person, Kathy says, can I have the above, can I have black coffee, green tea uh, during a three to five day water fast and still achieve optimum benefits? You definitely can, Kathy, as long as when you drink coffee or green tea or anything, it doesn't give you more cravings. It, when you drink coffee or green tea, you should feel great, right? The natural caffeine that's in those should be a performance enhancement. You should feel amazing. You should feel more productive, more mentally efficient, more mentally clear. You should not have cravings and hunger a few hours later. If you're noticing that you are consuming something, even something like coffee, and you get more hunger and cravings a few hours later, that's a sign your body is producing, it's having a stress response and you're producing insulin you're not responding well to it, okay? So important to understand that. Um, let's see, recent questions. I have type one diabetes and I'm on an insulin pump. Since my body does not produce insulin, what is your recommendation for adjusting insulin while attempting to get into ketosis? You know, th that's something you're really gonna need to be working with your doctor on. Um, so you're, if you're trying, if you're on a ketogenic diet and you're a type one diabetic, you need to pay very close attention to your blood sugar and uh, adjust your insulin appropriately. That's not something I can really give you medical advice on, but obviously you're going to need less insulin, a lot less insulin than you normally would if you're eating a higher carbohydrate diet. Helen asks, my husband has IBS and often gets diarrhea and cramping after having a high fat meal with little or no fiber. What suggestions Dr. Jockers have for him? Sounds like he's having a lot of issues with uh, bile flow. <clears throat> so most likely he has gallstones and very poor bile flow. So I did give some strategies. We have a bile sludge protocol where you take charcoal, you take um, our bile flow support can be really helpful. Um, there's a whole bunch of different uh, herbs that, that are really, really good for bile flow. So I would definitely check that out. I know I went over it in the keto masterclass. So review that section. And then I also have some articles on my website that go into more detail on that. So hopefully that's helpful. 
let's see, I can see some of the questions you guys have that are on live. And uh, again, I want to thank you guys for being on live with me. I think this is awesome. These have been amazing questions. And again, I want to just reiterate that, um, you know, producing this whole keto masterclass just took so much time, energy, and it was, you know, cost a lot of money for, for the level of video production. And um, I want to thank those of you guys. I, we could not do this without those of you guys that have supported us, that have purchased programs from us in the past, and that have chosen to put, purchase the Keto Masterclass. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for doing that. Um, you know, really, I create content. Uh, ultimately, like, you know, in a sense, it's like, it's one of those things where creating this sort of content is what excites me. This is what drives me. This is what I'm passionate about. But I couldn't do it without your support. So thank you so much, um, you know, for, for, for helping us with that. And again, I, I think you're going to get tremendous value if you consider owning the Keto Masterclass for yourself. I believe you're going to get tremendous value out of that. We have a ton of bonuses that go with it, as well as uh, all the transcripts, all the videos, um, the testimonials, tremendous life-changing trust testimonials that, that we had, that we filmed, and, uh, and all the notes. And so you'll get so much value out of that. So thank you again for choosing to purchase that or even considering it. That just means the world to us. So let's see. Sonia asks, oh, she just says, thank you so much for your usual excellence of work. Thank you, Sonia. I appreciate that. Elizabeth says, I've seen salmon in lots of keto diet cookbooks because it has healthy omega-3 fatty acids. I know that codfish also has this fatty acid. What other fish do you recommend? Um, I think wild-caught salmon is the most nutrient-dense fish, but you can also do things like herring, uh, sardines, fish that's low on the food chain tends to be uh, more nutrient dense uh, and more and richer in omega-3 fatty acids. So those are the ones typically I'm recommending. You could do, you know, chunk light tuna. You certainly could do that. Um, white fish, you know, you could do the other fish. They just don't have as much omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, what you want to avoid is the fish that's higher on the food chain, like albacore tuna, for example, shark, swordfish. Those are very high in mercury, so I would I would look to avoid those. And then also trying to get wild caught, not the, the farm raised. You're going to get more nutrients and less toxins from the wild caught. Let's see. Isabel says, when going in and out of ketosis, what's the longest time you should stay out of ketosis without interrupting your health improvement? Um, what's the longest time you should stay out of ketosis? Kind of depends on you and, and what you're trying to do. Uh, personally, I don't like to, I like to stay in ketosis. I might be out of ketosis for a day or two, okay? But I just feel so good in ketosis that I try to stay in that range, okay? You know, and, and ideally for me, maybe 24 hours, 24 to 48 hours, okay? And then I try to get back into ketosis. And I feel great that way. Um, Jim says, I'm not getting enough sleep four to four and a half hours doing OMAD, keto carnivore variant, and heavy gym four days a week. This only may have started after I started taking NAD supplements. Any tips to get six hours? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so number one is going to bed early. So good sleep hygiene is important. Going to bed early, you know, certainly four to four and a half hours, not a good, not enough sleep. Trying to be in bed by 10 p.m. every night would be, would be huge. Um, also, you can take some supplements like magnesium, which can be really helpful. Uh, some things like ashwagandha, some different adaptogens can be very, very helpful for helping reduce stress and helping you sleep better. I may cut down the amount of exercise that you're doing. You may be overtraining, especially if you're feeling like wired and tired and not able to fall asleep. So I think that would be helpful as well. Keeping your room as dark as possible using a sleep mask. Keeping your room cool. <clears throat> I know I sleep best in a <clears throat> very dark, cool room. <clears throat> Typically, I like the temperature around like 65 degrees, and that's when I <clears throat> that's when I, I sleep best. So definitely check that out. Uh, let's see. Other questions. <clears throat> I've got about five minutes left here, guys. Thanks again for being on with me.
let's see. Michelle says, why has the number for a fasting glucose level decreased to a lower number? I learned 80 to 120 was within normal limits. Later, 70 to 110. Why is 120 considered high now? Um, because it is high, Michelle. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. Um, 120 is very high. It's actually pre-diabetic. We want our normal fasting blood glucose under 100, and ideally closer closer to that, you know, 60 to 80, 100 range. If you're in if you're in ketosis, you may notice that your fasting blood sugar is is very low, like 60. You also may notice that it's a little bit higher. And that's actually totally fine as well, as long as you're getting into ketosis. We call that the dawn phenomena, where your morning cortisol levels increase your blood glucose. So that's actually fine as well. <clears throat> Let's see. Other questions. <clears throat> um, Eric says, can you discuss what you would rather recommend to someone losing weight between number one, OMAD eating 35 grams of carbs a day or alternate day fasting eating 100 grams of carbs per day? Which area would you lose weight with? So if you were to eat one meal a day but only 35 grams of carbs or if you ate every other day but when you did eat you ate 100 grams of carbs, which one, he's saying, which one would you be more effective with with losing weight? It's a really good question. I'm not fully sure. Um, it, you know, it kind of depends on the individual, uh, but I, I would tend to think the OMAD. Um, I think you know, just suppressing that insulin level for a good 24 hours, consuming you know a good quality meal that possibly has 35 grams of carbs in it, should be totally fine. You should absolutely lose weight that that way. I think both ways actually. You would you would probably do very, very effective uh, losing losing weight with those. So hopefully that's helpful. Guys, hopefully this Q&A has been really, really helpful for you. Um, you know, it's been, a, it's been a privilege and an honor to be able to do this. And again, I want to reiterate, uh, you know, just the Keto Masterclass, checking that out, considering owning that for yourself. Thank you so much for all your time and attention. And, uh, you know, definitely, uh, you know, you can always comment in on this video as well if you have additional questions. My staff and I try to answer all the comments that, are, that come in through our YouTube channel. So we do our best to do that. Thank you again, guys. Hopefully everybody has a wonderful weekend. And uh, again, consider owning the Keto Masterclass for yourself. We'd be super honored by that. And that just allows us, it just supports us and allows us to be able to create more great content like this for you. So thanks so much for all your support and uh, be blessed everybody. Bye-bye.